my pleasure to introduce uh, John McGee. Uh, I have to read his uh, profile. It's all in the first person, so excuse me if I get this wrong. Uh, uh, John's been involved in testing for almost 30 years and seeing a lot of changes, of course. Uh, he vaguely remembers the days and we used to run pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages. You get his drift of scripts manually. Uh, he loves exploring both software and the world around him. Uh, love helping other testers learn and grow. I set up in-house online test events where testers from around the world share knowledge, experience and thoughts around testing. And he's previously spoke at various conferences and meetups, uh, Agile Test Northeast, Manchester Test Bash, Ministry of Test Northeast, among others. Uh, John's going to talk about what are you looking at? Uh, and I'll let him, let him explain that. Uh, please okay. take it away, John. Thanks a lot, Paul. So we'll move straight into the talk. So I'll give you a little bit of a background before I actually starting the session. Session. So luckily in me in my job, I've travelled quite a bit around the world, some of the some of the big cities, and I've had a chance to visit some of the big art gal galleries around there. And while going to them, I was sort of looking at all these paintings and pictures, and I thought I like the look of them. I like I like to see, I like what I'm looking at, but I don't really understand what that's what they're supposed to be. They're supposed to represent. So what I do, like all good testers, to try to find a good oracle. So I bought this book, and it's it's basically it's an overview of modern art over the last 150 years, and it's written in a language that even somebody like me, like a Nathan, can understand. And when reading it, I started not started to notice quite a lot of things that could be directly related to testing. So either tools or techniques, quotes from or about the artists themselves. So even if you just got to pass an interest in art, it's well worth the read. So like I say, all these art galleries that I've been going to and look at in our art, I never really understood what they were trying to say, but this book pretty much changed that for me. So in the talk, hopefully you learn a little bit about art, a little bit about testing, so it's a double win. And I've also added a section about the old masters at the beginning. So here we go. I think a lot of you will recognize this one, the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. It's known as the cornerstone of high Renaissance art. So like a tester, Michelangelo and other artists at the time lit the way. When you think how how did he manage to keep that keep things in perspective and think of bigger pictures that he was painting by lying on a piece of scaffold and inches away from what from this? As testers, we often need to focus on the minute of the immediate where thinking of the bigger picture of the mission. I could imagine him breaking down the painting into small chunks while planning and simplifying the process, just like we do as testers with complex pieces of functionality. So we'll move on to the old master. So this is the Night Watch by Rembrandt. Was painted in 1642. And I think as testers, we can consider ourselves and, and our teams, because it's a big team effort, as part of the night watch, night watch, keeping our customers safe from bad quality software. Like the night watch and the painting, we need to remember that we serve many clients from the project manager to the programmer, technical authors, the technical development support teams, marketing, the business, and most importantly, the end user. So around this time, the artists had to adapt in many countries because of the Reformation. The Protestant, Protestant churches didn't require the lavish religious paintings that Catholic churches did. Landscapes, scenes of everyday light and life and portraits became more common. You can see seismic changes in, in technology and processes that we need to adapt to in the same way when we think of agile, mobile, cloud computing. During this period, everything had to be done in a certain way. Colors were subdued. Paintings had to be structured and confirmed to specific standards. Unless you are El Greco, who would likely be a little bit different. The one on the left is the opening of the fifth seal from the 15th century. And it was a major insp inspiration for Picasso, whose painting on the right, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, was based on this. We'll refer back to El Greco later on when we come to talk a little bit about Picasso and reinventing, reinventing the wheel. But for now, back to the old masters. So this one, this is one of my favourite paintings you can find in the National Gallery down in London. And it's Joseph Wright of Dar Darby painting his experiment on, on a bird in an air, in an air pump. And I just love how this picture tells a story, the traveling scientists demonstrating the effect on the bird in the vacuum, the reactions of the people watching, the young girls crying, the young lovers looking at each other longingly, the young men looking on with interest while the old fella just looks thoughtful. And then you've got the servant in the corner trying to do his job while keeping an eye on what's going on. So like testers, painters try to tell a story. As testers, we need to convey our thoughts and feelings to our audience and stakeholders. How we tested, what we tested, what we found the oracles and assistance we used, what we'd like to explore further, along with our thoughts about any risks to the project and the product, and what we need, and we need to do this in a concise, targeted, and meaningful way. 
So back in the day, Paris was the centre of the art world in the 1800s. The Salon de Paris was the leading art ex exhibition in the world between 1748 and 1890 and would reject everything that didn't confirm to certain standards. I liken this to the scripted tests of the past in which we had to follow finely defined paths. We stored cupboards full of these signed off tests. And if you weren't in a safety critical world, it was for pr pretty much no reason at all. And we never, really, we never ever seemed to look at them again. The scripted tests that were on were time consuming. They required maintenance. They were often incorrect. They restricted the test at the focusing on completing the scripts, discouraged exploration. They were detrimental to finding bugs that didn't fall in the scope of the script and encouraged unintentional blindness. Management also focused on the number of text cases executed as a good measure of project and progress and quality. And then there was light. The world changed. The impressionists painted what they saw. They tried to capture their impressions with an emphasis on the changing qualities of light. They faced harsh criticism and opposition from the conventional art movement in Paris and had their paintings constantly rejected for exhibition. So what did they do? They started their own ex exhibition to challenge this existing salon. You could equate this movement to the arrival of the agile or rapid testing movement in, it, in, in that it changed the way that we look at art in the same way that the agile testing movement changed the way that we look at testing. The exhibition featured this painting by Claude Monet. It's called Impression Sunrise and it gave the art critic the name for the impression movement, the impression, impressionist movement. It was meant as a disparaging term, but the impressionists appropriated it for themselves. So back in the day, the impressionists were enabled by new technology that pre-mixed paints and tin tubes allowing them to paint without having to mix, mix the paints themselves while painting, and that allowed them to become more spontaneous. In our world, ideas, technology, and testing tools are constantly changing. Keeping up to date with these changes allows us to focus or improve our testing. We can liken the pre-mixed paints to the tools which take, the take away the donkey work and allow us to be more creative as testers. So on the post-impressionists, they used to call Cezanne the father of all. Picasso called him that, who said that he required no master but him. The paintings called Still Life with Apples and Peaches, I wonder why. Cezanne would spend a lot of time getting his subject right before painting. He'd use coins to prop up the fruit in the bowl, for example, and push them forward. Like testers, he knew that preparation was key to getting things done properly. He started looking at things from different perspectives. So if you look at the jug, it's painted in profile and from above. And this was a direct precursor to the Cubist movement of Picasso and the like. He recognized that the human eye sees shapes rather than detail and was a proponent of simplification because of this. So as testers, we used defocusing techniques such as MFAT, multiple factors at the time, where you're putting lots of data in, in, in sequence to discover bugs in the same way. We, we need to look at things from different angle, angles and perspectives while explore, exploring. And then we'll use focusing text, techniques such as OFACT, where we'll just change one factor at a time and refer, return back to the known states after we've found an issue to try to work out the steps to recreate. So the impressionists came from the viewpoint of, this is what I see. Cezanne and the post-impressionists who came after questioned and said, is this what I see? Test us question and explore in the same way. Every test that we do is an attempt to answer a question. When te testing, ask yourselves, what questions should drive your exploration? So this is another Cezanne, Mount Saint Victoire with large pain. And you can see the simplification techniques here, especially in the geometric shapes of the fields. As testers, we often use simplification techniques to break down complex requirements so we can test at a lower level. For automation, the simpler or lower down the stack the test is, the, e the easier it is to debug and the quicker it is to run. When man manually testing, we simplify our tests using the OFAT method, method mentioned before to focus and investigate issues or when we are confused. With our simplification methods, we can use our conserving states and refer our data to a known state, simplifying our actions or just repeating actions frequently. So in this paint, he's highlighted the mountain and brought it forward to be much bigger than it is in real life. He felt it was the most important feature of the landscape, so wanted to focus on this. We do this with our bug reports, dashboards, and summaries of testing, highly, highlighting the importance of the things we wish our audience to be aware of and focus on. So paint has used various tools, heuristics, and processes in the same way that testers do. The branches across the top of the, the, the painting follow the shape of and frame the horizon. 
And while you can see the branch partway down the tree cuts across the space and seems to bring the mountain even closer. It's a common technique, common technique in order to do this. But this is pretty cool. Watch this. He also uses the tree trunk to frame the picture and create a sense of perspective. If you remove the trunk, it no longer, no longer looks three-dimensional. So his test has an addition to looking at things from different perspectives, just like Cezanne and the use of the pine tree. We've also got the ability or even the power to change people's perspectives of our products, of ourselves, of our teams and of our business. This is within our development teams, within the wider business, and most importantly to our customers. So we need to be really careful in how we communicate things to others. Cezanne spent all his life trying to perfect his art. A month before he died, he wrote a letter in which he quoted, will I ever attain the end for which I have striven so much for so long? And it's important to test us to continue to struggle and strive to better ourselves, constantly learn and questioning. You can't master testing unless you reinvent it. Use existing techniques, study them, question them, take them apart and put them together in a new way. You'll get things wrong occasionally, especially at the beginning, but the more you do this, the better you'll get at it. There's another good quote from James Whistler. You remember Mr. Bean and Whistler's mother, which also highlights this, which I think is great. He took the famous art critic John Ruskins to court for libel in London when he questioned the values of paintings of him in a gallery. Whistler was asked in court, oh, two days, the labor of two days, then is that for which you asked 200 guineas? Whistler replied, no, I ask it for the knowledge of a lifetime. And our knowledge and experience has the same value and we need to understand that we can't stand still, we continue to learn and would continue to develop our, our knowledge throughout our career. So we'll move on to photography. Um, 10 people with the same level of skill using a photograph with, from the same spot will likely produce almost exactly the same image. Obviously ISO, ISO settings and things like that and shutter speeds, etc. may have an impact on this, but you'll generally get a pretty, pretty similar image. But if you give them a paintbrush, they'll all paint differently based on the perspectives and the biases. As test as we all have our different skills, cognitive bias and our habits all cause us to test and see things in different ways. We can use heuristics to help overcome some of our bias and habits. UAT, mob, assembly and pair testing can also help us overcome these issues. We'll talk about some other ways to overcome these challenges later on in the presentation. So this is a painting called Boats at Colwear Harbour by Andre Duran. It's an example of a Forbes painting. So the Forbes used wild brush strokes and strident colours with a high degree of simpli simplification and abstraction. So you can notice how he's painted the sand a bright red to depict the heat of the beach. It's a simple technique to depict the warmth of the day. So said before, we present an image to our stakeholders of our testing, and we need to present this in a simple way catering to our audience. Our product owners aren't interested in the fact that we've run 10,000 automated tests and all of them have passed, but some of them had to be run twice. They're concerned about the quality of the product, how long it's going to take us to test, test it, any impediments or blockers that are stopping our progress, the simple things. You could show this pictorially during a sprint by using a dashboard with smiley faces, happy, sad, and different based on our current feelings as to the quality of product and the progress made to completion. So now we'll move on to Van Gogh. Uh, this is Starry Night. So one theory around this painting is that he managed somehow to paint the unknown and the undiscovered in the air currents swirling around the sky at night. This theory of fluid displacement wasn't discovered until 60 years after the paint was completed. And it's still one of the most complex in, in physics and it's still not fully understood. So as test as we need to discover the unknown and communicate this to our audience. We need to develop our questioning skills. Testing is all about questions, posing and answering them. We need to ensure we can understand complex theories and processes and communicate them to people in a way and at the level that they will understand. You could use the HURAS, H-U-R-A-S, heuristic to help your questioning skills. So, huh, you may not understand, really, what you understand may not be true, and you may not know the whole story. So, the truth may not matter more than what you think. So, you may have a poor understanding of risk. So the cubists tried to depict the subject from many different angles in the same painting. This is Picasso, girl with a mandolin. As test as we need to look at things from many different angles and perspectives. The SF Depot heuristic is a good example, both of a model we can use and a way that we can look at things from different perspectives at a very high level. 
So structure, function, data, interfaces, platform, operations, time, SF Depot. So Picasso used models that he created out of pieces of paper and card in his studio before painting. As testers, all of our tests are based on models to help us with our testing, whether be, they be a picture in your head, it could be mind maps, maps of the system under test, heuristic models, ideas of user, user behavior or others. All of your tests will be based on these models. So we mentioned earlier that El Greco was an inspiration for a lot of Picasso's work and that he said that Cezanne was the only master he needed. It's a great example of reinventing the wheel and learning from others who have come before. Picasso was a great experimenter, just as testers should be. Remember that the master testing, you need to learn to, it, to take it apart and question techniques that others have divined to understand them and make them fit for your needs. So this is Henry Rousseau. It was the hungry lion throws itself on an antelope. Henry Rousseau was a post-impressionist painter who fell into the primitivism movement. He came into painting late and he wasn't technically gifted in the way that Picasso and the others were. But Picasso said it took him four years to learn how to paint like Rembrandt, but a lifetime to learn to paint like a child. In this, Rousseau was far ahead of him. So we can attempt to cover all eventualities using tools and heuristics, but sometimes just giving an application to a non-tester or someone new to test that, testing and asking, them how to play, and asking them to have a play around with it, will uncover bugs or go down paths that you may not have thought of. Like Rousseau, they aren't restrained in the same way that people with the technical skills that we have are. We're restricted by our habits and our built-in biases as testers. They are like the child that Picasso took a lifetime to be. So when you think about the fresh eyes find failure, introduce variation wherever you can, switch with another tester when looking at something for the first time, pay attention to what confuses you, when you work with new additions to the team, test alongside them and watch the, how they react to the product while testing. So this was another Cubist painting by George Brack. He was Picasso's great rival and friend. For around six years, they were inseparable. There were two vastly different characters. Brack was an introvert, while Picasso was a massive extrovert. Parent together, they both learned and benefited from each other's strengths in the same way testers can learn and benefit from pairing and mobbing with each other or with developers or people from other non-test disciplines. It's a great example of the diversity that we're talking about before in the previous talks. So you can see at the top of the paint, he has painted a nail in a normal non-cubist way. The nail in the paint and roots us into reality. It serves as a beacon of stability and an expression of exploding forms. He thought a full, fully cubist depiction would be too much for us to comprehend. You can see the same technique in other paintings of his. It's a bit like the long leash heuristic. It's okay to be distracted while testing and go off on a different route of, of exploration, but we need to continually take stock of our mission. The long leash of the heuristic is like the nail in the painting. It roots us into the reality of our testing. So this one, this is the first example of pure abstract art. It's by a guy called Kazimir Malevich. So by abstract art, we mean that there's nothing rec recognizable in the image. Suprematism was an art movement based on basic geometric forms formed by the artist Kazimir Malevich. You'd say it's influenced in the streamlined designs, design, streamlined designs of the day. Think of your Apple iPhones and the like. So prior to this, it was down to the artist to show us what they want us to see. Now the onus has been placed completely on the viewer to decipher the piece. So when you look at this painting, have a think about while I'm talking and have a think about what, you, what, what do you see? What do you think it represents? But in simple terms, the painting represents everything, darkness and light, heaven and earth, life and death, the universe, you, me, everyone here, everything. Malevich called it the ground zero of painting. So by that, he, I think he meant that if you take a painting such as the Mosley, Mona Lisa and you take away the lady and you take away the landscape and the bridge behind her and things like that, the trees, all you're left with is the black square. So it's, it's, it represents pretty much every painting that's ever, ever going to come to fruition. If I hadn't told you that we could have come up with all, come, went on all day, coming up with the meanings for the painting. If I wasn't here, you would never know if you'd come up with the correct conclusion. So as test as we need context and requirements to let us know when we can say that our testing is complete. With both simple and complex software, we could test without these, but if we aren't getting information that we require, it becomes, un, um, it becomes almost impossible to know where we are done. So in this situation, I was the Oracle. It's important to know who or what these are when testing. People, help, systems, books, comparable systems. And again, it's another great example of people having different views, ideas, bias, and habits. 
how do we capture these and show they're all covered when testing through we do that through heuristics through pairing ensemble testing uat and now we'll move on to the next painting which is Malovich's black square. So you painted four of these. Why? What was he thinking? Your guess is as good as mine. I think I've got a good idea, but I'm not too sure. But I think he's the first time he ever showed this painting in public. He put it in the corner of the room. And that's where the religious icons went in Russian sort of Russian households. They'll have a, a, a religious icon in each corner of the room. So I think the four black squares represent, represented those. But when we talk about repetition and testing, it's very important. If we want to repeat a test several times, it may appear to automate it, but there are reasons for repetition. So the reasons for repetition include regression, benchmarking, finding intermittent issues, importance of the test. When we're doing this, we've always got we've always got to consider cost versus value and what could be gained by some of the tests that, that we never performed because we're repeating these ones. So when we look at Malovich's one of the Malovich's other paintings sold for $60 million a couple of years ago. If the black square was to go to the market, it would sell for much, much more, which is strange considering it's something that any one of us sitting in this, sitting in this uh, session could, could do. I could paint it, you could paint it. But what people are paying for, for this is the idea. Malovich came up with that idea first, which leads us onto the daddy of Dar Dardaism. It's Marcel Duchamp. So Duchamp believed that the end product was, wasn't what was important in art. It was the actual idea itself. The concept becomes before the art in the same way that the manifesto, the plan or the mission becomes, becomes before the act of testing. So as test as creativity is a critical part of what we bring to the table. Our, idea, our ideas are an important part of who we are and what we do. However, in our world, the end product is the even more important than the idea itself. The act of configuring, operating, observing and evaluating is the most important. Dardaists believed that all of their art came before them was worthless and looked to make a change in society by tearing it down and rubbishing it. They broke, they broke rules and anarchy prevailed. So intent were they in opposing bourgeois culture that they were barely in favour of themselves. Dada is anti Dada was a favourite battle, battle cry. Like the Dardaists, testers are constantly breaking rules and challenging things. They push field, field boundaries, take user counts over the acceptable level attempt to run software and below spec museums just to see what will happen. I think I was on one of James Box rapid software testing courses quite a few years ago now. And one of his favorite sayings at the time was testers break the rules. Unlike the Dardos, however, we still work under certain constraints to fulfill our mission, our objectives and our stakeholders requirements. And this one's a artwork by John Arp. Squares arranged according to the laws of chance. Dada, it's like Arp embraced chance as an alternative to rational thought, which they felt contributed to the horrors of World War I. So this was created by dropping squares onto the paper and gluing them where they fell. I think it looks like it was a pretty accurate square drop, although considering how they all seem to fit and float together. Randomness is really important in testing. The human brain doesn't lend itself to this at all. So if you get a group of people and ask them to pick a number between one and 20, a large number of people, almost a fifth in some studies, will pick 17. So when testing, we need to try to introduce randomness into our choices. I'll say automation, automation written all the time with easy to calculate numbers, such as 10 or 100 for transaction values. Manual testing suffers from the same issues and won't pick up things such as rounding codes by com complex calculations. There's a few websites out there, such as random.org, that you can use to generate your test data in, this, in situations like this. So a lot of the modern art movements began with manifestos setting out their aims. As mentioned in the previous slide, the Dadaist one picture seemed to be about bringing down the system through ideas while tearing down the current art world. As testers, we have things which are a little bit more constructive, such as the Agile Testing Manifesto. It's sometimes a good, good idea to get together as a team and discuss this or maybe define your own. So when we talk about the Agile test, Testing Manifesto, it's testing throughout over testing at the end, preventing bugs over finding bugs, testing understanding over checking functionality, building the best system over breaking the system, team responsibility for quality over tester responsibility for quality. So we'll move on to the really weird stuff now. So this is surrealism. So Dahl used to put himself in a paranoid trance to allow himself to paint. And you had other surrealists such as Joan Miro, they painted with no preconception of what they were going to paint and just painted whatever came into their head. 
ideas, feeding off the ideas, which resulted in dreamlike paintings such as Persistence of Memory, which is the one pictured. Ooh. Go back to, there we go. So we work like the surrealists when exploring and fulfilling our missions. Each idea feeds off the previous idea and leads to another one in a way that we are unable to predict in advance. And what we often discover allows us to explore further. But unlike the surrealists, we should have a very good idea of what our mission is before setting off on our exploration. Remember, though, that it's OK to be distracted while doing this, as long as we use the long leash heuristic to periodically keep us in check and remember what we were originally intended in the test. And this was Jackson Pollock. It started his move to abstract, ob abstract ob expressionism. It's an example of action painting. Peggy Guggenheim of the Guggenheim Museum fame had commissioned him to paint a mural for her, for her apartment. He stared at the canvas for six months every single day, unable to come up with an idea until Peggy gave him, gave him an ultimatum one night and told him if he didn't make a start on it, the commission would be canceled. So that night, that night in a frenzy of painting, he went and completed this in 12 hours. This test as we could have saved him six months, six months if we didn't reduce him to the plunge in and quit heuristic. So if you ever find yourself testing and you find you've got no questions about the product, take a break. If you're learning a new tool or technology and find it difficult, take a break. And when you come back, you'll find that things start falling into your place. Your, your mind will start gathering things together and putting things together like a jigsaw. And you'll find you've understood a little bit more and you'll be able to move ahead. And if you get stuck again, just repeat the process. Just keep repeating that cycle until you've got that knowledge. So on Rothko, so what this was the other side of abstract expressionism. This is colour field painters. So in Rothko, we had an artist who broke away from the status quo. He created a completely new style, which was radically different from everything else at the time. And he had the conviction and the self-belief to persevere, even in the face of doubt as a naysayers. Sometimes a bit like a tester. So this painting, it's an expression of the artist's feelings or thoughts. Rothko wouldn't frame or name his paintings as he wanted the viewer to contemplate them without obstruction or bias and the painting to simulate emotions in the viewer. So he wanted this viewer to have the almost the same almost religious experience that he had when painting them. But on a darker side, Rothko's paintings went from bright and cheerful when he first started painting to dark and depressive using different shades of black as he was diagnosed with a serious heart condition and slipped into al alcoholism and depression. So as testers, we need to start, try and remove conscious and unconscious bias from our testing in the same way that Rothko did by refusing to name or frame them. Again, we can do this through heuristics. Rothko said that his art was a simple expression of a complex thought. And that's a pretty good description of abstract, ex, abstract expressionism in general. It's also a good at guideline when planning our tests. We need to simplify the complex requirements in, into easily understandable and testable chunks. We also need to simplify complex test results into digestible reports for our stakeholders, the people who matter, like, like Guggenheim was. We can do this in the pictorial form through the use of our dashboards. But I think there's an important point to make about Rothko and his descent into darkness and depression. I've been in a similar position myself with anxiety many, many years ago. I was lucky enough to have people around me that I like to talk to about it and unload. The hardest part for me was opening up to them when I realised that it's okay not to be okay, and it's also okay to talk about not being okay about it, the journey back to the light began. But a common refrain from people looking at modern art is that anybody can do it. It looks easy and the paintings often look simplistic. I haven't seen videos of Pollock scribbling, scraping and teasing paint across a canvas. That's definitely not the case. It takes a lot of skill to do that and a lot of creativity to come up with the concept and ideas to begin with. Like art, testing isn't easy. It requires a particular mindset, a significant amount of discipline, and a lot of skill to master it, if that's ever possible. It's a constant challenge to learn new techniques, tools and technologies. Not everyone can do it, and certainly not everyone can do it well. Keep practicing, keep questioning, keep sharing, and keep learning. But before he became who many considered the ultimate American painter, Pollock had one of his earlier paintings submitted for one of Peggy Guggenheim's exhibitions. She absolutely hated it. Before the exhibition, she noticed Pierre Mondrian, the famous Dutch painter, kneeling down and staring at the painting. She tried to drag him away, but he told her that the, painting, paint, uh, the painter 
would become the most important painter that America had ever produced. Mondrian was a person who mattered. During the exhibition, Guggenheim dragged everyone that she could to the painting and told them what Mondrian had said. She became Pollock's major sponsor and the rest is history. As Tess says, we need to know the people whose opinion matters, and especially the people whose opinion matters most. It could be BAs, product managers, customers. And we also need to know our oracles in the same way that Guggenheim did. Who or what can we get the information that we need to be able to test? And remember, oracles aren't necessarily people. They could be manuals, market materials, help systems, or other products. So on Andy Warhol with his pop art. So Warhol was famous for taking familiar objects and including them in his art pieces. And as test says, we can use the familiar to assist us in our testing. For example, we can, com we can compare similar programs or pieces of functionality. We can check existing reports and compare against new ones or new functionality to confirm data is correct. We can check that items are the brand and to confirm the style guides. So the factory was Warhol's art studio in New York. He had workers making silk screens and lithographs lithographs under his direction. So as testers, it's important to remember that we are part of a bigger development team, all working towards the same goals. But unlike Warhol, we don't rubber stamp a release. We provide the information required for other people to make those decisions. So as art in general, the FBI, surgeons, military intelligence, and others use art to improve their observational and descriptive skills. And as a general team building exercise, what they'll do, they'll take a painting, and they'll describe it either individually or as a team. They'll look what they can say in the painting, what they can infer from it, learning differences between perception and inference. It builds out their inquiry and critical thinking skills and helps them to improve how they articulate. All of this is important for a tester. So it may be a useful exercise to take as a team, as it's a great team building exercise. I'll paste the, I'll paste the link into the chat later around, um, around this sort of subject about how an art, an art historian teaches FBI agents and surgeons how to say. So move on to the scrunch, munch and the, the scrunch, <laughs> munch and the scream. There's a few things we can link with this. So bugs escape and testing, it happens to us all. Treat it as an opportunity to learn, run root cause analysis and retrospectives. Remember the plunge and then quick heuristic. If you're struggling with something, take a break and come back to it later. Build up your knowledge and skill over a period of time. When we're learning new things or we're picking up a new piece of work, understanding is really important. Don't be frightened to say you're confused and that you don't understand. If someone tells you something and you're, and you're, and you're confused, use those question heuristics that we talked about before, the URAS one. Oh, you may not understand really what you understand may not be true and you may not know the whole story. So the truth may not matter more or matter more than you think. And sometimes team leaders and project managers could look like this when they get the initial test estimates. Everybody's got different priorities and needs, but you can negotiate, you can build up trust over time. Don't cry wolf. If they've got confidence in what you do, they'll listen and you'll be able to negotiate successfully. And finally, back to where our journey started, Michelangelo and the Sistine Ch Chapel. So when Michelangelo was asked to do this, this work, he was torn by self-doubt and he refused to do it. He was a sculptor, not a painter, he claimed. There was no way he could do what was being asked of him. He fled back to Florence, and, and, and no lesser than the Pope sent people to the city's leaders asking them to convince them to come back. And luckily for us, they managed to do, do so. Throughout the work, the Pope encouraged them and gave them the confidence to achieve what he did. When you want to achieve something, you often think of things that cause you problems doing it, even at the point of stopping you doing it altogether. But once you start doing that thing, you find that you often find that things aren't as bad as what you thought they would be and the problems are easy to overcome or they don't even exist at all. You often wonder what you were worried about in the first place. So as testers, build up that network to support you, to encourage you and to mentor you. Have confidence in yourself and your skills. Use things such as the pull engine and quick heuristic to help when doing new things. Know that sometimes confusion, is, confusion and doubt are part of human nature and it will happen. Accept that there will be times that you'll doubt yourself but also accept that you have that ability to overcome your, any challenge or learn any skill. Public speaking is a great example for me personally. When I first started, I used to worry a lot about it. The more that I did it, the more comfortable I got. And I even started to really enjoy it. You realize people are really supportive and they aren't there to judge you. 
it's the same with learning new tools or languages. You'll get frustrated, you'll get annoyed and confused, but you, the more that you do it, the easier it becomes. So remember, it's always okay to ask for help. Remember the plunge in and quit heuristic. And most of all, remember Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. Thank you. Hi, hey, Paul. John, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, that was a, a ramble around the uh, uh, most famous uh, <laughs> examples of art in the world, I guess. It was. <laughs> Hard to keep pace with you. Uh, oh, it's, fantastic. It's that, Geordi, I, it's that Geordi accent as well, Paul, I think. I, no, I can do with that just. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm from the Northwest. I'm not so far. Oh, away. All right, sir. <laughs> well, I, I don't know where to start. I, I, well, first thing, I need to uh, ask people to post questions for John on Slido, if you can. Um, yeah, no, that was a lot of it. I, I was going to say, I, do you think art is, oh, well, you know, the, the, the visual art is, yeah. is, is, is special in that, is it one example of a kind of a, an artistic endeavor that you could use for examples? Or do you think it's unique? I mean, what do you think? Are we, so like, could you use dance in the same way or? or poetry I think, or i think art's probably the easiest one to sort of make the connections between because of the like i said there is that many similarities between the two sort of fields yeah. well, it's visual as well you, isn't it yeah, yeah you can see when you think about picasso used to hang models of guitars in, the, in his sort of art studio and used to build models to of various yeah. things to sort of to pick what he was going to paint in the same exactly, way yeah. that we build models so, so so there's so many similarities i mean you should buy the yeah. book Paul, honestly because it's you'll read it and you think oh i think like, that is a test or we do that and and it's just amazing. <laughs> so I've just just come back last night from Milan. So I what was is? I went to the the Brera, which is like one yeah. of the best um, uh, galleries. I mean, it's got nothing to do with testing. I'm sorry, what I was going to yeah. say, but <laughs> but it, it's remarkable in the the, the, the notion of uh, there's a scale model of the uh, cathedral, you know, the Duomo mm -hmm. uh, in there, yeah. which is about fifteen I don't know fifteen foot long, mm -hmm. five meters long, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it dates back to the date, uh, the 16th century. It's in remarkable yeah. shape. So, of course, like we build models. So, I'm, you know, you oh, probably definitely. know I'm an obsessive about models. I think, yeah. um, and, and I don't think that's a challenge to anyone in that I think you talk a lot about heuristics. Well, heuristics yeah. are just models that tend to be on oh, a yeah, smaller yeah. scope. That's all. Yeah. So I, there's no, I've got, uh, uh, I'm fully in support of that. Of course I am. So, I, but it, it's hard to know what to make of it, what you've said, because yeah. you, you, you basically loaded a whole lot of ideas into oh, yeah. stuff and associate with art and i'm just wondering well should we have a gallery of art on the wall to remember all this <laughs> stuff like like a crib sheet <laughs> I, can, I can share my slides i mean i mean i intentionally didn't put any words on on the slides and things like that because yeah. it's all about the paintings and making those connections between things and, and i think as test as our brains work work like that anyway we'll look at something or we'll see something and we do make those connections i think we're sort of wired that way that way anyway to, yeah yeah when, it, when you're sort of picking up things and you're testing things you'll know something in the product and go oh i wonder what that does and i wonder if i do that in here it'll yeah. impact that and things so yeah your brain's yeah. constantly wired and working like that and I, I think one of the things that, that that we don't know enough about yet is how our brains work obviously yeah. but also when we when we're on a journey you know of discovery you know with a, with, with say a software product yeah um we remember things not through photo photographic memory we mm -hmm. tend to remember what came before what's the story yeah. you're trying to uh follow and be able to relate later on yeah. i suppose uh, and it and it's um again you've just got me thinking i'm i'm yeah. and I'm, I'm still thinking if you know what i mean i'm still processing I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what it's all about and i mean there was that yeah. much and that many different connections in there to to, to take in and the one sort of 30 30 minute sort of slot yeah but, uh, i know i know I mean, I mean, I, I, I'd like to see a picture book with uh, some text, and then I can relate yeah. the picture to the thought. Yeah. <laughs> As it I mean, is, I've got ADHD, so my short-term yeah. memory is rubbish. <laughs> I've got the slides, so I'll make those available to everybody afterwards. If uh, oh, cool, yeah, yeah. If you'd be, but uh, are, like I say, gonna... I, it's, it's the way that test does work as well, though, because uh, I was going to all these art galleries, and we want to know how things work. We want to take things apart and and discover the in in our, in our sort of workings of it and things. So that was a good example, of, right? I look at this this stuff i don't understand it yeah let's buy a book let's find an oracle so i did that and bought this book i couldn't get an art professor and yeah. drag him wrong with us all the time and things like that so i did the simplest yeah. thing the next best thing and that's what we do don't we? yeah in our career, so yeah I'm, I'm familiar with the um 
uh, Picasso's quote on uh, all. I think I think he said all children are born artists. Yeah. And you might say all all children are born inquisitive, and we yeah. systematically suppress yeah, that there to be different uh, emotion or uh, yeah. ambition through um, having uniform yeah. teaching, examination, yeah. syllabuses, you know, whatever. Yeah. We systematically kind of close it down and make it uh, yeah. feel like it's a bad thing almost to be creative. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I kind of get the. So Picasso said something like, uh, "All children are born artists." And it took me 40 years to rediscover how to paint yeah. like a child or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and that, that was, was, that was the one with uh, with Rousseau in the slides that I showed before. Yeah. Yeah. Rousseau, he, he painted like a child in the, in the permanentism, permanentism yeah. movement. So it was like really... But it's, but it's, of, all, it's all up here, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing. Oh, yeah. and, 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 you know, we've all encountered the people who think testing is just bashing keyboards and yeah. doing things uh, you oh, know, yeah. like pirate fashion, and which is obviously clearly yeah. nonsense. But it, it's it's we're, we're still arguing that case, aren't we? Oh, yeah. You know, well, hopefully, show them this presentation. You'll, they might put the, the idea that testers are really, really creative people. You know, and, and yeah. we are. We're well, constantly indeed. creating. We're, we're building scripts. We're building. what testing. We're constantly thinking while we're testing. And what happens if I go down this route? What happens if I go down that route? And uh -huh. I think we're more creative than most people out there. Yeah, we might, just, we I, might I, paint this, we might paint the Sistine Chapel, but I think we're, we do it in our own minds sometimes. I mean, sometimes we, we encounter software, which is probably a bit more complicated than this. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about it. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, so, we're simplifying break it down. We're, we don't we like artists to yeah. do exactly that. Yeah. And it's and it's really like um, uh, our, our, our task is to communicate what we're discovering in a way that makes sense. So what we know in terms of a whole lot of pictures in our head it's incredibly difficult to communicate. So, oh, you know, to me, the communication aspect and negotiating yeah. um, scope and, and you know, all the other good stuff with stakeholders, yeah. whoever they may be, yeah. is a big, it's a human problem, absolutely. It and then it's a thinking problem beyond that. Yeah. You know, where does the technology come in? Well, that's a, that's a Johnny come lately, isn't it? Mm. So, uh, anyway, uh, we're overrunning. I've just noticed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, I could talk all afternoon, Paul, honestly. This is obviously Sorry. one for the pub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. So, so, John, thank you so much uh, for your uh, contribution. And, uh, uh, yeah, fascinating. I'm really, my head's spinning. It's buzzing. Right. So take care, mate. Uh, lovely to see That's you. Lot. And you, Tara. Uh, yep. Yeah.